In this lesson, we're going to study the second chapter in our textbook of classical grammar. If you look here at this last point from lesson one, we learned about words and sentences. Now the problem, if we want to study the words of a language, is that there are thousands and thousands of words, and it would be impossible for us to ever master a language if we had to study the language word by word. Fortunately, wise men in the past have done the work for us and have explained to us how language works so that we can study language and master the grammar of a language without having to study every single word in the language. So we look down at lesson two and we see that we're going to study the parts of speech, the parts out of which speech is made. So in lesson two, our subject is the parts of speech. And in grammar, the study of the parts of speech is called etymology, etymology. So let's go ahead and walk through this lesson on the parts of speech. We start here with point number eight or article number eight, and we learn the first of the parts of speech, which is a noun substantive. The name of every object, the name of every object that has or is conceived by the mind to have an independent existence is called a noun substantive or merely a substantive. The name of any object that has an independent existing existence. That means that it's able to stand alone and have meaning. And we're given some examples here, rose, flower, man, London, and modesty. These are examples of noun substantives or substantives. Let's consider the word rose. Rose is a name of an object. And the name rose can stand alone in speech. It can exist independently and have meaning. That makes it a noun substantive. Man is another example of a noun substantive. It's the name of an object and it can stand alone. It can exist independently or by itself and have meaning. That's a noun substantive. And that's the lesson of article number eight. Know what a noun substantive is, the first part of speech. Next, we go down to point number nine, article number nine, and we learn about a second part of speech. We learn such words as can stand immediately before a substantive to denote some property that we perceive in objects is called a noun adjective or merely an adjective. So a word that cannot stand by itself but must stand immediately before a substantive in English. A name that denotes some property that we perceive in objects is called a noun adjective or merely an adjective. Now the reason why an adjective noun cannot stand alone or exist independently like a noun substantive is that a noun adjective names a property and the property exists in the substantive noun. So for example, let's look at these five adjectives that were given. Sweet is an example of an adjective noun or a noun adjective. Sweet cannot exist by itself. Something must be sweet. 
So there must be some substantive. Anytime we use the word sweet, there must be sub, some substantive that we're thinking about because sweet is simply a property of some substantive. Sharp. If I say the word sharp, you can't think of sharp by itself. You have to think of something that is sharp, like a pin or a knife. There must be some object in which this property exists. An adjective noun cannot stand by itself, but it must be set next to some substantive. And that idea of being set next to is what the word adjective means. So the second part of speech here is a noun adjective. The first was a noun substantive. The second was a noun adjective. Now, there are, there are notes all through this chapter, and many of these notes, you can read them, but they're not very important. Like this note here, note A under point 9, says, It will be seen below that a particular class of adjective words are called participles. Well, that's really not important right now. It's simply telling us that we're going to learn about participles in another part of this lesson. So let's leave that for then. So, so far we've learned two parts of speech, noun substantives and noun adjectives. And you need to make sure you understand what they are. You can give examples of them. And if you look at a reading, you can point out noun substantives and noun adjectives. Let's keep moving because this is a long lesson. Article 10 here. The peculiar adjective words a, or an and the are called articles. This is a third part of speech. Now, you can see that they're called adjective words because they're set next to substantives. It, we, could, we could argue that these really shouldn't be considered parts of speech, but they should just be considered adjectives, and that's fine. But what we want to learn in rule number 10 is what articles are, what articles are. And here are the two notes, note A and note B down on the next page, are actually very important. The peculiar adjective words A or an and the are called articles. And there are two kinds of articles. A or an, which are really the same word, a or an is called the indefinite article. It marks that we are speaking of some one of the objects named. So if I say, I ate an apple, it means that I ate some one of the apples that existed. A or an is called the indefinite article. Next, note B. The is called the definite article. And it marks that we are speaking of a particular object. The is a definite article. A or an is the indefinite article. Just listen to these two sentences and think of how different the image in your mind is when we use the two different kinds of articles. I ate an apple. Think of that sentence. I ate an apple. Now think of this sentence. I ate the apple. I ate an apple. I ate the apple. You can see the difference that these articles make. When we say an apple, we mean one of a number of apples. When we say the apple, we mean one of one apples. There was one apple and I ate it. I ate the apple. The is a definite article. A or an are indefinite 
articles. Because these are set next to substantive nouns, they are called adjective words. And we could argue about whether these should be counted as another part of speech or just included with adjectives, but it really doesn't matter. Let's keep moving. Note number 11. You can see the note 11 over here. Every word by which we express that persons or things do anything or are anything or have anything done to them is called a verb. So a verb is the next part of speech and we learn every word by which we express that persons or things do anything or are anything or have anything done to them is called a verb. So you should know what a verb is. And we're going to see a bunch of notes here and examples because verb is the most important of the parts of speech. The, the word verb in Latin is verbum, and that simply means word. And some believe that the Latin speakers called verbs verbum because they were the most important verbum or word in the sentence. If we don't have a verb, we can't have a sentence. So the verb is another of the parts of speech. We have some examples here, to run. To run is a word by which we express that persons do something. We say that Thomas runs. Runs is a word by which we express that a person, Thomas, does something. Thomas runs. Runs is the verb. To run, to walk, to hurt, to bless. If I say, I am blessed, I'm saying that something has been done to me. I have been blessed. I am blessed. Then we have some notes here. To be is a peculiar verb by means of which we join the name of a property to the name of a thing. The rose is red. Red is the property and rose is the name of the thing or the object. The rose is red. Because we're speaking about the property of the rose, it's better to call the rose the subject because we're talking about the rose. The rose is red. The colors, colors is the subject here. The colors are, that's our verb, are bright. And bright is the property. Bright is an adjective noun. The colors are bright. So to be and any form of the verb to be, like is, are, were, shall be, will be, was, and so on. These are words by which we join the name of a property to the name of a thing. Next we learn, since the properties that we perceive in things are subject to change, the words is and are are altered to denote whether the property existed at a former time or exists now or will exist at a future time. So we learn that verbs express time. Not just action, but also the time of an action. Here we see the rose is red. That's present time. Here we see the rose was red. That's past time. And here we see the rose will be red. That's future time. So we have present, past and future time. Different forms are used to express present, past, and future time. But these forms are different forms of the same verb. Okay, so verbs 
express time. Next, note number C, to become, to become is a similar verb by which we mark the acquisition of a new property. The road becomes impracticable or impossible to drive on. The road becomes, that means it acquires some new property. It wasn't impracticable before, but it has become or it becomes impracticable. So to become is another example of a verb. Note D, the notion of a verb may be added to a substantive without being formally asserted of it. The forms which are used for this purpose are called participles. Participles. Now, what a participle is, is a word that partakes. This is where the word participle comes from. It participates in the characteristics of an adjective and of a verb. It's sort of a verb adjective. It does both. It expresses some kind of action. It expresses time, but it's used like an adjective. And we're given two examples here. A sleeping boy. Boy is a substantive noun. Sleeping is like an adjective in that it, it names some property that exists in the boy. The boy is sleeping. But it expresses time. It's present tense. And therefore, it has characteristics of verbs and characteristics of adjectives. And that's what a participle is. It's used like an adjective, but it's actually a form of a verb. Another example here is given for the past tense a broken stick. The stick is the subject, that's the substantive. And broken names a property of that stick, a broken stick. But broken expresses time, it's past tense. So it participates of both the quality of a verb with time, but also with an adjective in that it names some property that exists in the substantive. So participles are like verbal adjectives. They're like adjective words that come from verbs and they express time. These are called participles. Make sure you know what a participle is. Point E, we continue. Hence, a participle is an adjective word that besides the notion of property also conveys a notion of time or of a completed or incompleted state. So when we study verbs, make sure you know generally what a verb is, then understand the importance of the verb to be then understand how verbs express different times. Then understand the notion of a participle, an adjective word that expresses both a property of a substantive and time that relates to that property. That's a participle. And that's what this lesson teaches us about verbs, which are the next part of speech. Let's keep moving to note number 12, or rule number 12. We're going to learn another of the parts of speech. Such words as add to the notion of a property or action, some circumstance of time, place, or manner are called adverbs. So here we have another part of speech, adverbs, words that add 
to the idea. Notion means idea. Words that add to the notion of a property or action. Some circumstance of time, place, or manner are called adverbs. So notice, adverbs are added to adjectives and verbs. And they add some idea of time, place, or manner. And these are called adverbs. Let's look at the notes now. Note A here for rule number 12. Though they are called adverbs, which means words joined to verbs, ad means to, and verbs is the word we've learned before. Though called adverbs, or words joined to verbs, they are also joined to adjectives. So that's important. Don't let the word adverb confuse you. Remember that they can also be used with adjectives. And here we have some examples. So we have A, nasty medicine. Medicine is the subject. Medicine is the substantive. Then we have nasty. Nasty is an adjective noun. So we have a nasty medicine. But in this sentence, we want to add even more. We want to express some manner and add to the notion of the adjective. We want to say something more. It's not just nasty. That's not enough. It's very nasty medicine. The adverb adds to the idea of the adjective. Not just a nasty medicine, a very nasty medicine. So very is one example of an adverb. Here we see the storm rages violently. The storm is the substantive, the subject. Rages is a verb. It expresses action and time. The storm rages, but that's not enough. We need to say more. There's something more that needs to be added to the meaning of this verb. The storm rages is not enough. We want to add more to the property or to the verb. And we say the storm rages violently. Violently is the manner in which the storm rages. The storm rages violently. Violently is the adverb. And it's important to see here that one way that we can identify adverbs is by the ending ly. That ending ly is always a sign of an adverb. Now you'll see that the word very is an adverb and it doesn't end in ly. So it's not always a sign of an adverb, but most of the time an adverb will end in the letters ly. And we see that here in the next example, terribly, and here in the next example, swiftly. So one mark to remember, to look for, is the ending ly. When you see the ending ly, it is likely going to be an adverb. So let's look at these examples. The next example is a terribly passionate man. Man is the substantive, our subject. Passionate, passionate is an adjective noun. It expresses a property that exists in the man. He is passionate. But we want to say more. We want to talk about how he is passionate. And so we say he is terribly passionate. Terribly. Terribly is an adverb. And then lastly, he runs swiftly. He runs swiftly. How does he run? He runs swiftly. Swiftly expresses the manner of how he runs. He runs swiftly. 
And remember to watch out for that ly ending, which often identifies an adverb. So that's our um, talk about adverbs. We go on with another note here. The adjective and the adverb are essentially the same. They are both names of property. We shall find that sometimes the same word is both an adjective and an adverb. So one word can be used in different ways, in different sentences. <coughs> if you look up some words in a dictionary, and in the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, we provide you with access to the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the best English dictionary. If you look up a word, you'll find that it may actually be more than one part of speech. A word may be an adjective and an adverb. And the reason for that is in different sentences, you'll see that the word is used in different ways. In one sentence, it's being used like an adjective. In another sentence, it's being used like an adverb. So it will, it's difficult to identify what part of speech a word is because sometimes a word can be more than one part of speech. One helpful way for us to figure that out, as I said, is to look at a dictionary because the dictionary will give us examples and we can see what example is closest to what we see in the sentence and that will help us to identify the part of speech. So that's all for adverbs, which are our third or fourth part of speech. Next, we have the pronoun. A pronoun is a word that stands for a noun. The Latin word pro, pro, means for. So for a noun is what a pronoun is. A pronoun is a word that stands for pro a noun. Pronoun stands for or in place of a word. Pronouns save us from the necessity of repeating the noun. So they are convenient, but they are not a necessary part of speech. When the persons spoken of are known, they sometimes make it unnecessary to name them at all. So pronouns are just used to make speech easier or nicer to listen to. Pronouns save us from the necessity of repeating the noun. So if I say, Mary went to the store and Mary used Mary's purse and paid for Mary's groceries with Mary's money and then Mary took Mary's groceries and put Mary's groceries in Mary's car and then Mary drove Mary's car to Mary's house and then Mar and we went on you can see how repeating the noun is is annoying it doesn't sound nice and if we change that to to use a pronoun the pronoun she or her we could say, Mary went to the store and bought her groceries with her purse, and then she put her groceries in her car and drove her car to her house. You can see the pronoun makes the speech much more pleasant and smooth. That's the, that's the, the, the use of a pronoun. It's not necessary, but it's convenient. It makes our language more pleasant. Here we have some examples. Suppose Henry is speaking. He may say, I think so-and-so, instead of saying, Henry thinks so-and-so. If he is speaking of himself and Charles, he may say, we think so-and-so, instead of saying, Henry and Charles think so-and-so. So pronouns are used in place of nouns to make speech clearer or more convenient, but they're not a necessary part of speech. That's the pronoun. 
And again, we're going to study all of these in detail in our grammar lessons. All we're trying to learn in this lesson is what each of the parts of speech is. So you should know a substantive noun, an adjective noun, an article, a verb, a participle, an adverb, a pronoun, and we're going to learn a few more. So just focus on learning what the parts of speech are. We're not going to pay a lot of attention to the examples because we're going to study all of these parts of speech in great detail in future lessons in classical grammar. So let's keep moving. Point number 14 here, a word that marks the relation of one thing to another is called a preposition. A word that marks the relation of one thing to another is called a preposition. So this is another part of speech. Let's look at some examples. All of these are examples of prepositions. On, in, over, under, through, above, below, from, and so on are all prepositions. They stand, and this is important, before a substantive or some adjective word, which is prefixed to a substantive. Before a substantive, placed before is what the word preposition means. Preposition means placed before. So that's what a preposition is. It's a word that marks the relation of one thing to another, and it is placed before the substantive or adjective that it refers to. Okay, that's what a preposition is. And these examples give you a good idea of what a preposition is. On, it expresses relationship. So the book is on the table. How do book and table relate to each other? What's the relationship between book and table? Oh, the book is on the table. That's the relationship. What's the relationship between these two people? Oh, the man is with the woman. The man is with the woman. With is a preposition. The water is under the bridge. What's the relationship between water and bridge? The water is under the bridge. Under is a preposition. Next, note B. The primary relations marked by prepositions are relations in space, relations of local position. The primary relations marked by prepositions are relations in space or local position or place. The prepositions used to denote these relations in space were then transferred to analogous relations of time. So what the, all that this is saying is that prepositions can be used in strange ways. Normally, prepositions refer to place or space, but they can be used to express ideas of time. For example, if I say, he stood before me, he stood before me, here, before means in front of me, and it means in front of me in place. He stood in front of me. But we can also take this preposition to mean in front of me in time. So, for example, he lived before in front of Caesar, not in place, but in time. He was before him, as if he was before him in the line of history. So prepositions can be used in a couple of different ways. That's the point of that note there. Next, point number 15. A word that joins notions or assertions together is called a conjunction. And all the word conjunction means is 
a joining together. A word that joins is a conjunction. Here we see an example. The rose is red and sweet. And is a conjunction. It joins red and sweet. It joins them together. Red and sweet. I wish that I could see him. Here, that is a conjunction because it joins these two verbs. I wish and I could see. I wish that I could see. That joins these two verbal ideas. So that's a conjunction, a word that joins or that separates. Like, you can have milk or juice. The word or is a conjunction, but it separates the two things. You can have milk or juice. So we'll learn about conjunctions later in grammar. Next, rule number 16. A word, generally a simple sound, used to express some inward feeling, is called an interjection. Interjection is the next part of speech, a word used to express some feeling. Let's see if they give us some examples. Nope, we're on to the exercises. So an interjection is a word that expresses feeling. And we use these all the time. If you get scared and you yell, ah, that word, ah, is an interjection. It's a word that expresses some feeling. Or if you see something that's beautiful, you may say, oh, that's another interjection. It expresses a feeling. Or you may say, wow, that expresses a feeling. That's an interjection. You may laugh and say, ha, that's another interjection, a word that expresses some inward feeling. Okay? That's an interjection. And those are the parts of speech. So through rule number 16, We've learned all of the parts of speech. Let's just go back up to the top of this lesson and walk through the parts of speech one more time to make sure everything is clear. We start here at point number eight. We learned the first part of speech was the noun substantive. We can say that the second part of speech is a noun adjective. Again, sometimes um, different grammar teachers, different books, will separate these as different parts of speech. Sometimes they'll put them all together. So a noun substantive and a noun adjective will just both be called nouns. They'll just be considered two different kinds of nouns and noun will be the part of speech. But we could also say that a substantive is one part of speech and an adjective is a different part of speech. That's fine. Know what a noun substantive and a noun adjective are. Next, in Rule 10, we learned about articles. You should know what articles are, that articles are a kind of adjective word, and that there are two kinds of articles. Indefinite articles, like the words a or an, and definite articles, like the word the. Okay, the article. So we have substantives, adjectives, articles. Next, in Rule 11, we learn about verbs. Every word by which we express that persons or things do anything or are anything or have anything done to them is called a verb. And we learned about some different important verbs. And then we learned about participles and we learned that a participle is a, <clears throat> is a word that participates in both a property, like an adjective, and time, like a verb. We then learned in Rule 12 about adverbs, words that are added to verbs or adjectives to express the time, place, or manner of them. And we looked at some examples of adverbs. 
And we saw a little hint that this ending ly often marks an adverb. All right. On to rule number 13, we learned about pronouns, words that stand in place of a noun. We learned that they're not necessary, but we use them because they make language more pleasant. Pronouns. Rule 14, we learned about prepositions. Prepositions are words that mark the relation or the relationship between two different things. We learned about prepositions. In point 15, we learned about conjunctions, words that join ideas together. And lastly, in rule 16, we learned about interjections, words that express some inward feeling. And we looked at some examples like wow, oh, ha, and so on. So these are the parts of speech. You're going to need to go back through these and memorize, memorize each of these definitions because they're very important. All of these rules that have the numbers set next to them in this lesson should be memorized. So memorize the definition of each of the parts of speech. Okay. Now further in this lesson we have exercises to do and I've turned these exercises into quizzes for you. So on the lesson you'll see quizzes under the exercises. And what you're going to do is simply start learning to identify the different parts of speech in a passage that you read. Uh, but as I said, I've created quizzes for you to complete to do the work of these exercises. So you don't need to do these exercises separately. You can do them using the quizzes on the lesson. And that brings us to section three here. So that's the end of lesson two. Lesson two, just to get back to the top here, the subject of lesson two is the parts of speech, which you see here up top. We learned the different parts of speech. We walked through and looked at each of them. We looked at the definition for each of the parts of speech, which you should memorize. We looked at some examples. We learned some, um, some notes about each of the parts of speech. This is a very important lesson because as I said at the beginning, um, if we wanted to master a language, if we want to learn a language, we can't study every single word in the language. So fortunately, we can divide all of the words into a small number of different groups, and these groups are called the parts of speech. I also said that the study of the parts of speech is called etymology, which is the second part of grammar. Okay, so that's of a first reading and walk through for lesson two in classical grammar on the parts of speech. Now it's your turn to study this lesson for mastery, memorize the definition, complete the exercises uh, on the lesson page, and then finally complete the lesson exam. If you need any help or have any questions, please contact me on live chat or use the contact form to submit a message. I hope that's a helpful introduction to lesson two in classical grammar. God bless your studies.